again, the, uh, the songs minister so deeply, just the words themselves, the way they're presented. You, you, we are who you say we are. I got real quiet there and just listened to you guys singing that behind me, and it was beautiful. I can tell you it was, it was awesome. So uh, keep it up. Today we'll be reading from uh, Romans chapter 8. The words will be on the screen, but um, you can follow along in your Bible, the New American Standard. We'll be reading the first 17 verses. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So then, brethren, we are under obligation, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, But you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. If, indeed, we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. Please be seated. This week and next, we're going to be talking through Romans chapter 8. In my mind, it's probably one of the, the greatest chapters in the Bible. I'm sure we all have our favorites. But Paul has really um, come through and speaks to us as believers. And, and I, I title this, More Than Conquerors, More Than Overcomers. Because the, the key verse in this chapter is Romans 8.37 but in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us and uh, we will be getting to that next week but uh, I had to quote that verse because as it says on the board it's Julie's favorite verse she hadn't looked up so I had to uh, (laughs) give her that And if we do have favorite verses, that's an absolutely good one to have. I preface this sermon today as kind of a... If you've been a Christian for any length of time, you probably have experienced an area of weakness in your life where sin creeps in and, and, and gives you grief. Not just take driving, for instance. That exercise of patience in which a seemingly normal person 
transforms into a fire-breathing beast of wrath and anger on the freeway. Now, I'm not talking about you or me. I'm talking about the other guy. You know that. But, you know, we find ourselves pushed, right? Challenged. So we respond back. So the truth statement in all this is we have a choice. We have a choice in how we respond to the other saints on the road. No one has the power over you to make you lose control of your emotions. Fortunately, our buttons get pushed and we respond sometimes in a less than sanctified way. And at least you think it even if you don't say it out loud. And this is really only one, one little area, one matter. And probably isn't even applicable in your life. But no matter the situation, no matter, there's, there's people, there's places, and there's things that happen in our life that they're folded into our day. And we have a choice on how we respond. Unfortunately, we sometimes pick door number two, which is the, the wrong choice. And even when we promise we'll never do that again, we end up doing it again. I can say that this story ends at the foot of the cross where we stop and we pray and we ask for God for forgiveness even if it's asking for God for forgiveness again. In all this, we ask ourselves, why? Why, why, why do we have this situation that just keeps taking us over? How come in our whole life that we were forgiven but we're frustrated by our actions? We're not alone. This is Paul's plea in Romans chapter 7. Let's turn to verse 24 and 25. Get a little introduction here. Paul, after detailing all the things he does that he doesn't want to do and the things that he should do that he doesn't do, he turns around in verse 24 and he says, Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. For then on one hand, I myself, with my mind, am serving the law of God, but on the other hand, with my flesh, the law of sin. Wretched man that I am. The question is, is there no solution provided for us in which we can achieve victory? And Romans chapter 8 is God's answer to this key question. And yes, the answer is the indwelling Holy Spirit of God. He is the source of divine power for our sanctification and the secret for spiritual victory in daily living. And this is key for us The greatest asset we have in this spiritual battle against our fleshly desires is God himself present in us through the person of the Holy Spirit. The word spirit is mentioned 21 times in Romans chapter 8. Actually, all in the first 17 verses which we read today. Because the second half... Second half of the chapter transitions from the focus of our present struggles to our future victory. And that's next week's offering. So we have an outline. Outlines are very helpful. When I find an outline that I I can help put my mind in the right place, I hold on to it. So the outline of Romans 8 is that we have freedom, key word, freedom, from judgment because we have no condemnation. Verses 1 through 4. 2. We have freedom from defeat because we have no obligation to serve the flesh. Verses 5 through 17. We also have freedom from discouragement. There's no frustration in God. 
and there's freedom from fear. Because why? We do not have separation between us and God. There's verses 31 through 39. So if you have your Bible, Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 4, let's take a look here. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the, free, the law of sin and of death, freedom from judgment. The law of God, this, the Spirit of God has set you free. The word therefore, verse 1, it refers to this previous passage, which details our inner struggle. And it says, there is now no condemnation. In fact, in the Greek, it says, no condemnation now. And it's very strong. Presently, there is no punishment for those in Christ. You have been judicially declared not guilty. The sentence of death is removed from everyone in Christ Jesus. We are a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Verse 3 Through the substitutionary death of Christ we're justified. Because it's a, de- it's a decision that God determines for us. When he looks at mankind, what does he see? He sees fallen mankind. He sees everyone guilty. No one is without guilt. But now, through the substitutionary death of Christ, we're justified. Justified means just if I'd never sinned. It's a declarative statement. The judge looking at the, at the um, accused and the defense attorney, Jesus Christ, says, don't, don't take his righteousness, but take my righteousness. And in that case, the judge says, case closed, not guilty. So we stand there in the grace of God. Romans 5, 1 and 2 says, since it's so close, it says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into grace, in which we stand and we exalt in hope of the glory of God. Romans 5, 1 and 2. We've received an introduction. We're justified by grace. And we're standing before God. Not under his wrath. Because it says the wrath of God is on all mankind. We possess eternal life now. Eternal life now. We're not waiting for eternal life. It's not like we have to transition from this world to the next to obtain eternal life. We have eternal life now. We should act like it. We should be thrilled about that. Through Christ. Through Christ. He condemned, God condemned sin in the flesh. As it says in verse 3, I believe. He condemns sin in the flesh. We can't do it. The Mosaic Law says what sin is. And we have failed in every effort to live by that law. No one could keep it perfectly. Therefore, everyone is under the death sentence. Now Jesus, the Holy One made flesh, the solution to our problem. He becomes flesh so that this law which God put out could be fulfilled. That's what verse 4 says. In order that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Fulfilled in us. What did we do to fulfill it? Nothing. We can't. And that's why Jesus, he died in our place and he paid the price. And just as a person cannot be tried twice for a crime, we cannot be judged guilty a second time. 
if we're in Christ. Our penalty is satisfied. Payments made secure in Christ. So the good news is actually great news. It's the best news we have. How can this change a life if the recipient truly understands that their sin and their guilt no longer defines them or confines them? They're no longer captive. How many hospital beds could be emptied because the person's guilt would be removed? Their shame, their fear of punishment. It affects people physically, mentally. Sin weighs heavy over people, affecting health even. John 5.24, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who has sent me has eternal life, does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. Note the three actions here. Has eternal life. Present, possessive. You have it now. Does not come into judgment. What judgment? Judgment's been taken care of. And is passed out of death into life. Again, present, possessive. And this is transformative. <clears throat> but we struggle. We still struggle. The reason is, it's called I. I. I, as a total person still have an old nature. You do too. That old nature has a capacity and a compulsion to sin. It has the ability and it has the desire. We have an old nature. But we also have a new nature. That which is made alive in Christ. So we have a spiritual struggle. And this produces what Paul wrote earlier in chapter 7, being a wretched man that's wrestling with yourself. Now, let me say this. An unregenerative or non-believing person doesn't have the same spiritual battle in themselves. How can they? They only have one nature. So, again, we shouldn't be surprised when they act the way they do. So use your ability, use your ability to pray for them and then spread some light in their life. You might be the ambassador of God that assists them to see the way to redemption. God still uses us. God still calls people to the cross and God still saves souls. So again, in verse 4, we have the ability to walk in new life according to the Spirit. Because of that, we are free from condemnation. We're also free from defeat because we're not obligated to sin. And that's the next section. And that'll be verses 5 through 17. We're free from God's judgment that we just heard. Now let's look at what's being defeated. Our sin nature is called the old self, as I mentioned. Romans 6.6 6 actually has that reference. Romans 6, verse 6. And he says, knowing, that, knowing this, that our old self, our old self was crucified with him, that our body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. We're not obligated. It's true that God makes our spirit come alive. The problem is this old self being done away with does not evaporate away at the time of conversion, which would be nice. It would be great. We could be saints and actually live that way, but we're still human. We're still imperfect. And we still wrestle with the old self. And that's why chapter 7 is a self-reflection of the inner turmoil that we've all felt in living the Christian life, wrapped in this shell of sin, but in all this wretchedness, we do receive a reprieve from judgment and death. Reading verses 5 through 8 of chapter 8. Let me read this here. 
<clears throat> and note there's a number of, of contrasts between light and dark. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For the mindset on the flesh is death. But the mindset on the spirit is life and peace. Because the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So, the four negatives is, if you're in the flesh, that's a, that's a bad thing. However, in verse 5 it says, you're in the spirit. That's a good thing. Those who are in flesh experience death. Those in the spirit, verse 6, experience life. Verses 6 and 7, there's a war with God if you're in the flesh. However, in the spirit, you have peace, peace with God. Instead of Verse 8, where you please yourself, you have the opportunity to please God. Now, I have to say, this does not mean that every unsaved person never does anything good. We all have friends who we wish were saved, but aren't. But they're good people, and they, they, they're moral. And I'm not saying that a believer never does anything bad because unfortunately I've, I've seen and have had examples of those who even as believers have done things with evil intent. What it does mean though is our bend of our lives are different. One lives for the flesh, one lives for the spirit. A spiritually dead person may be moral, doing good things, but they lack the spiritual life in Christ. Warren Wiersbe calls the unregenerate man the person who lives at the lowest level of life. Now, he doesn't call them a low life. That would be wrong, labeling them. They say they live at the lowest level of life, spiritually dead, and will be lost for eternity unless the grace of God enters their life and the Lord rescues them. That's the lowest level of life. So, if there's a lowest level, there must be a second level or a next level. Verses 9 through 11. Let's read them. However, you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. And if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who indwells you. Second level, a person who has faith in Christ. Now, you'd think that's the top level, because what else can you have? Faith in Christ, that answers it all, right? But there's a maturation process that we're going to talk about here, and it's called growing deeper and closer to God. The Spirit of God dwelling in you changes you motivates you, instructs you, leads you, tells you when you're doing something wrong, encourages you when you're doing something right. And as we grow deeper and closer to God, it's not when you have the Spirit in you, but when the Holy Spirit has you in obedience. We respond to the call we're no longer living fleshly. But now we have this spiritual bend towards following God in obedience, willingly, 
not out of being a slave to it. God's freed us from that. Verse 9 says you're not in the flesh. Verse 12 says we're not under obligation to live in the flesh. So our real living begins when we step over the fleshly deeds and live in freedom from these. And that's the third level. That's living at the highest level. Not that you have the Holy Spirit in you, but the Holy Spirit has you in obedience. And there's a difference there. Verse 13 says, it has the action of you willingly putting to death the deeds of the body. And in doing so, it even pleases us to do the right things that please the Lord. At the end of verse 13, it says, by the Spirit you're putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Three words, you will live. Live. Zao. And that is not breathing, just existing, but it's to experience life supernaturally even. To enjoy real life as God intended it for us. To have true life in our body. People recognize. People know what makes you different. The same thing that makes you look at someone and, and, and say, I bet they're a believer because <laughs> they just have too much joy in their life. And then you find out it's right. Or someone pulls you aside and asks you, so, you know, what's your secret? Why are you always so upbeat at work? Why can you handle these things when everybody else seems to be crumbling? How can you live above the mess? And you say, I have the Spirit of God in me. I know Christ. We're active. Well, let's see. We're worthy of the name of Christ. And we're active, blessed, and living this life endlessly in the kingdom of God. That's what it is. You will have life. You will live. It's the same life that the rich, young ruler lacked. It's the same life that the prodigal son went off to search for. And it's the words used by the angel when they ask the women, why do you seek the living one among the dead? Life. You will live. Verses 14 and 15 are key because we can have assurance and confirmation that we're in God's household as we're being led by the Spirit. For all who are being led by the the Spirit of God These are the sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. And that's a witness. That's the witness of the Holy Spirit in our life. Not one of slavery and fear, but of adoption and acceptance. Do you remember? Think back when, when your life changed because Christ came into your life. And he came in and he swept out all the cobwebs and put light where there was not light before. Now, if it happened when you were like four years old and you don't remember, I understand. But some of us as adults, when we became a Christian, we knew something had changed. Behold, old things have passed away, new things have come. Because we're new creations. 2 Corinthians 5.17, which I blanked on earlier. But we have not a slavery or fear in our life, but adoption and acceptance. We're released from fear. I think the adoption is something we don't think about very often, but we're placed in the family of God. We, we're, we're a new identity, a new father, a perfect new father. And because of that, As it says, Abba, Father. Verse 15. It doesn't get any more personal than that. Abba is actually Aramaic. It it comes with it, the personal name that 
Only you can call your dad Abba. Nobody else can pull that out. And the Jews actually adopted it because they wanted that in their language. Abba, Father, Daddy, lift me up. I'm here. And when you say Abba, Father, you're tied directly to God. And that's a close personal thing. Religion does not give us that. No religion gives us that. This is only by faith. This is only by walking. Having the Spirit of God in you, you can identify with God this way. Daddy, my Father. Verse 16. And the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. You can read that verse and says, God's spirit and our spirits both say we are in agreement that God is our Father. We are children of God. We're identifying with that. Which gives us the opportunity of being not only children, but heirs. Heirs. There's something we'll be receiving. We have spiritual blessings. Ephesians 1 3. If you could turn there. Ephesians 1 3. Paul writes and says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. We have spiritual blessings. Not only some, but every spiritual blessing is ours. We are to receive that. Now, if you think the Christian life is just a cakewalk, cakewalk, which we will have at the Harvest Festival, we also have some identifying with Christ that we suffer with him. Turn to 2 Timothy 3.2. 2 Timothy 3, 12. As I look at 2 and it does not make sense. But look at verse 12. And indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Because why? You will set yourselves apart from those who do not want to see righteousness who are reminded of how bad they are and want to drag you down. But you stand tall, unapologetically, in fact, and compassionately. You can say, no thanks, that's not for me. And then, if there's any blowback, we suffer with him. Not because... We were a jerk and we we, we lorded over somebody our relationship, but that we actually explained our relationship with God in such a way. And their response. Because when we do it the wrong way, we may suffer, but it's not in Christ. Suffering because we're just being wrong about how we do things. Additionally, 1 Peter 4.12. Turn there because we'll be looking at the next verse as well. 1 Peter 4.12. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you which comes upon you for your testing as though something strange were happening to you. Don't be surprised. If you live for God, someone's not going to be happy about that. Don't be surprised. But it's a test. God wants to to test you. He wants to form you, make you stronger. So that we may be identified with him. 
And, and in Romans it says glorified with him. 1 Peter 4.13 But to the degree that you share in the suffering of Christ, keep on rejoicing so that also the revelation of his glory you may even or you may re- rejoice with exultation so that also the revelation of his glory you may rejoice with exultation. Because in verse 17 of Romans 8, it says that we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. We do not receive glory, but we participate in God's glory. We participate in Christ being glorified. And that's what these verses mean. To be glorified with Christ is to see his glory. Freedom from judgment, no condemnation. Still living under condemnation? Be free from it, folks. Switching, switching to number two. This here? Okay. As we wrap up here, if we feel condemnation, remember, that's not coming from God. As a Christian, we are freedom from any judgment. So change your mind. If you ever turn to yourself and say, I'm no good, that's evil thinking. That's not spirit thinking. That's fleshly. No condemnation now for those in Christ Jesus. Freedom from defeat, number two. We don't have an obligation to serve the flesh. We don't. Holy Spirit's in you, and now you are participating with the Holy Spirit. And you walk in agreement with him. You have the ability not to walk in defeat. You don't serve the flesh. Remember, or let me say this, I've not created a shopping list of all fleshly deeds Disobedience and sin does not need to be categorized by me because you know it when you step over the line. You know it when in your life something goes awry. That's another ministry of the Holy Spirit as well. We can overcome these things. The book of Jude has one chapter. And it's quite an interesting little chapter. And in fact, the end has a closing praise, a prayer or praise benediction. And this is what I want to read to you. It's Jude verse 40, 24. Jude verse 24. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Take that verse. Put it in your heart because this is the result of walking without judgment, without defeat, because we're standing in front of the Lord God and we're standing not in judgment, but standing, participating in his glory. That's the picture that we put in our heart. That's what we aim for every day. And that's what I believe God wants us to know, even to put it in practice this week. Change the way you think about yourself and also allow God access into areas of your life that you didn't think you could give him. Let's pray. Father God, we just stop right now and we, we do kneel at the foot of the cross. Because we we confess, Lord, that we are not perfect. That even though we're in Christ, 
we sin, our old self, the old nature, has a way on us. But Father God, thank you for your Holy Spirit who lives in us. And thank you for the ministry of the Holy Spirit to guide and direct us, to change us. And Father, I pray by my will that I would turn myself over and be obedient to you, that I would give you access into my life, complete access. Make me the kind of person you want me to be in Christ. And Lord, I I rejoice that I do not stand in judgment anymore. I have passed from death into life through Christ. I pray, Father, for anyone here today struggling with this issue, if they don't know you, Father, that this is the day that they come to know you. But also, Lord, if they do know you, but they're walking in defeat, that this is the day that they can turn that over to you as well. Because we can come to you. You're our Father. You're our Daddy. We're personally connected to you and this family. And so, Father, we come. We ask that you just now take us closer to you. May this week be an example of this. May today even be an example of this. That our thinking gets changed and our actions also. Give us love for our neighbors, our co-workers, and give us boldness, Lord. We just thank you, Father, for these things. It's in Christ we pray. Amen.